Hello, Lindsay. Do you, I'm gonna leave. You guys mind signing our, uh, our motorcycle right over here? This will be given out to one lucky winner at our next Fan X next year. We're signing it right now. Perfect, thank you. And Lindsay, you can go to sit right over there. Perfect. Once again, guys, give a huge round of applause for Lindsay and Lee. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Rich Bonaducci. I'm a film critic and entertainment reporter with Fox 13. Thank you very much. And uh, this is very exciting for me because you two have basically created a whole generation of people who answered their mother's call for dinner by going like this. I was one of them. I know you, I know you have done it as well. To this day, I'll lean in and go... Duh, duh, duh. So, uh, just to start off, did you think, back in the day, in the early 70s, when you signed the dotted lines, that people would still be talking about the six million dollar man and the bionic woman now. Not really. <laughs> but we didn't have time to think about it. You know, it was such an ordeal making those shows. That was in a time when we didn't have second units and all the technical kind of help they had today. So it took a lot longer just to do the simple things that we were doing. Lee? No, I didn't think about it at all. I was just thinking about getting the work done and then getting out of there and going home. <laughs> Uh, Long yeah. hours. Yeah, you mentioned how technical it was one of the first shows of its kind to do those kinds of effects and all these kinds of things. And of course, uh, there was a telemovie that kind of started all off in 1973, and it was such a popular thing that they added another movie and another movie, and then said, let's just make a series, Six Million Dollar Man. And then they brought you on board, and you were killed off, actually. But you were so popular that they brought you back in your own series. It's, it's wonderful stuff. How does it feel to be one of the first people cryogenically restored? Well, it felt better in the daytime when we were doing it than when I went home without it. <laughs> so when, it's, it's, you know, I, I'm assuming when you got that call that, oh, we want you to be in this very popular show, you're like, great, and we're going to kill you. Wonderful. And then you got the call that said, we want you to have your own show. What was that like? Well, the first part of your sentence really wasn't how it happened. <laughs> Honestly, I didn't even own a TV at the time, and I had never seen the show. I just got this script with reading somebody jumping off of buildings, and it's like, whoa, okay, sci-fi. And I told my mother about it, and she, <clears throat> She said, oh my gosh, they want you to be the bionic woman? And I, I said, yeah, why? And she said, that's your, because I have a sister that's 14 years younger than me. So at the time she was like, what, 13, I guess. And she, and she said, that's her favorite show. And I went, really? So now I had to really come back. I didn't back. know that. Your mom liked me? Your mom liked me? My mom and my sister. Cool, thanks. <laughs> So basically, uh, I did the show for my sister because the start date of the show was her birthday. Talk, talk about it being, you know, meant to be. It's like, so I said, okay, we'll do this. Having no clue what was coming or what it was. And then I finally had to go watch the show at somebody's house. And I was like, oh, wow, okay, jumping, running. <laughs> and then it went on from there. And then they killed me and then they brought me back. I know I share that, that coveted spot with... Um, Charlton Heston being maybe the only two people on television who've been resurrected on prime time, you know. <laughs> but anyway, it just kind of had its own voli velocity, volition after that. It was, it was just one foot in front of the other. And it's because of you all that The Bionic Woman even came about because they weren't going to do a series out of it. It was literally by public demand because you all loved him and then it wasn't they all really. all loved you. And yeah. I did too. In fact, um, I had been doing this series for a season or so, and uh, I had been working with 
machinery and Andre the Giant and uh, you know Bigfoot and weird places like uh, empty factories and uh, rundown uh, water and power facilities and stuff. So it was very boring to me, and I hadn't had a love interest. And I told the producers, I said, you know, I'm getting tired of looking at these hairy leg crew guys <laughs> every day. Could you just please get me a love interest? And that's what happened. So I, I'm very appreciative of that. Well, me too. <laughs> then came, of course, the skydiving accident where conveniently you lost two legs, an arm, and an ear. You made it handy for the show. Well, I had the eye. So That's what I'm saying. She got the ear. <laughs> I always wonder what would happen if he'd lost just one leg. <laughs> a bionic hop? I don't know. I guess <laughs> you do what you got. But then, of course, it was so popular that they brought you both back for uh, extra movies and things. And in the end, bionic wedding. You got your leg. Yeah, we ended up doing, doing three. Yeah. Three more movies after we did the series. I don't know why they canceled it. It probably could have gone a couple more years. And I don't know why it took them three, three shows, three movies, to get to a point where they said, well, maybe this will work as a series. They're not too smart, Universal, sometimes. <laughs> well, that's for sure. You know, um, um, with the bionic... They tried to make a bionic girl with... Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. They tried uh, to do a bionic girl after Lindsay uh, and... Uh, they cast this young lady that uh, we worked. It was like the second or third one we did after the series. Movies, yeah. It was a, it was a two hour movie, uh, and uh, the young girl was, was, I thought, we thought she was really very good. But then uh, we heard that the network said they didn't think that she could carry a, a series on her own. And of course, from Sandra Bullock. So that's how smart they were, also. And then, of course, we did, you know, and then finally, we, we finally got married on the last movie. Uh, Thanks to Two me. hour Thanks. movie. I finally said, okay. <laughs> you know, she's finally said, okay. But then, because then we, we said, well, what are you going to do if they asked to do another one? I said, it would probably be from an old age home somewhere. And we could run around in uh, wheelchairs and have a great time. <laughs> Can you imagine you that? Have, you, you know, your veil kind of gets hung up in that. <laughs> you're going down the Runaway bionic bride, like... I got two words for it. Bionic baby. Well, no, they tried already to put a dog on my show. If you remember, they came and said, Lee, we, we have a bionic dog. His name is Max, and we want him... Uh, you want him on your show? I said, no, 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 no. I don't put no dog on my show, no bionic. <laughs> so you take it over to Lindsay and maybe she'll, she loves animals, maybe she'll do it. He totally did that. <laughs> Send it to her show, I don't want it. But well, I loved it, he was right. I loved it, we loved it, kids loved it. Yeah, it's just that, you know, there's that old saying in the business, don't ever work with animals or kids because they're not so terribly controllable, but they, these dogs were amazing, as you could see. It's pretty good. The only problem with it is that all these stunt dogs, they're trained for their commands from their handler, and they're not really socialized with people. It's not that there's any bad thing, it's just they're not really people-oriented. And so, in order to get him to come over and kiss, 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 you know, got liver smeared on your face, and all kinds of crazy things to so that was the only downside, but it was fun. And you had to do your close-up talking to an apple box. Because you do the scene with the dog, and they put him away so he could rest. Now you do all your scenes talking to the dog and all that, like looking at this apple box. Ooh. <laughs> anyway, that was... Oh, you cute little apple box! Oh, you cute little box! That's acting. Yeah. It also sounds like a preemptive no to Bionic Baby and Bionic Beagle. No kids, no pets. Wow, the sound of a beagle to begin with? You want to amplify that? Yeah. Yarr. 
Okay, well, these, these kind of things are what people want to hear about because anyone can read the Wikipedia page. But this behind the scenes stuff is what they want to hear. And frankly, they want to hear from you. It's the first thing they said to me when I met them back there. We want to hear what you have to say, the questions. So we've already started to line up. If you don't mind, we'd like to start right away taking your questions. Thank you very much. And uh, welcome, your highnesses and uh, <laughs> childhood heroes of mine. I uh, appreciate the work you did. Um, I've got three teens, or close to teens now, um, and you know probably kids don't listen to their parents. So I would ask you, with your accomplishments and the things that you've done in your life, what is uh, a piece of life advice that you could impart to young women and young men? The uh, question is for both of you, and I would appreciate that very much. Thank you. I think Lindsay would be great for that answer. <laughs> See, just like he did with the dog. <laughs> wow. No, she's more into, into, into life and wellness and stuff, and, and uh, has, has been doing these tours about just that kind of stuff, and I thought maybe you might know more than me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, I, I guess I would say that, and it's hard to just do it really quick, short, but something to contemplate is that your experience of any life circumstance is a function of your perception of it, not the thing that's happening itself, not what that person's doing, saying, not what's going on in the world. It's your perception of it that causes you to suffer, causes you the, the pain, or certainly the amount of pain. And so in exploring what it is that I'm thinking about that or holding about that and holding about my, my thoughts about myself, my worthiness, my, my strength, what I think of myself, we have all these false beliefs about ourselves, and then we encounter hardship or difficult people or whatever. And what you don't see, what you see is what you don't have or the fear you have or whatever. You don't see, oh, that person's suffering. Therefore, they are acting like this. It doesn't mean you have to let anybody you know, mess with you or whatever. It just means that you're going to be way more upset, way more in, in way more pain if you let yourself believe what you're saying about yourself. So here's a question that you can always ask yourself when you're hurting about anything. Just say, what am I making this mean about me? What am I making this mean about me? And contemplate the answer to that, and then you can change that and say, hey, you know what? That's, is that really true about me? It's actually not really true about me at large, so why am I believing it right now? If you can let go of that thought, you're going to find yourself in a very different place, and you will respond differently to the same stimuli. Thank you. That was wonderful. <laughs> I'd like to add just a, another little thing to my perspective, and that would be to, for the kids out there to listen to their parents, put down the uh, social media stuff, the fake book, <laughs> the Insta whatever, and listen to your parents, and you'll go a lot further than you ever thought you could. And uh, I know the parents want to bring you up right, and uh, the things that you find on social media is not good for you sometimes, and I think that's why we have a lot of um, disturbed kids out there today. So it's up to the parents to be parents. I remember, though, when I was young, uh, it, 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 was, uh, it was, if I had done something wrong, I got a spanking. And of course, that today is like, oh, that's child abuse. Well, let me tell you, it works. <laughs> and, and, and just the thought of getting the spanking worked. I didn't have to get spanked, but just the thought of I was going to have to get spanked will make you think about what you're doing and what you did. So parents, don't, don't spare the rod sometimes. Just go easy, but they'll understand. And you kids, listen to your parents. Thank you. Yeah. I wouldn't want to get spanked from the bionic man. Uh, Bionic woman, that would be okay, but... 
Okay. You have your show. Oh, KB thought. Yeah, I wish we need to it. read these consent KB. cues better. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out is that the, it's a very echoey room just to make sure that they hear you, make sure you get right in the mic for, for your question. Okay. Um, thank you both for coming. I have waited 40 years for this moment. <laughs> But um, my question is for Lee. I love you, Lindsay, but this one is for Lee. On Six Million, um, there was one particular episode that was filmed in Kanab, Utah. And I was wondering if there is any memories that you have while filming on location in Kanab. Uh, I, think, I think that there was a, a show about a lion, a mountain lion. Or something that we had to track down, or something. And of course, they had the uh, the animal handlers come in with this uh, this lion that we had to deal with, a cougar or whatever. I think it might have been a cougar or something. I don't know. But anyway, uh, it kind of got out of its cage at uh, at lunchtime when every all the crew was having their lunch, and, and everybody panicked and they started to run like hell. <laughs> I, I remember Utah very well. But, uh, <laughs> No, I enjoyed it here. I also was here one other time in Salt Lake City for maybe over 20 years ago for the Promise, Promise Land with Roma Downey Jr. I would have wrote that, that show. So that was my only couple of times I've, I've been close to Salt Lake City. But I want to tell you, it's a beautiful city. It really is. And people have so far in this convention, this is probably the nicest convention I've been to. Believe me. Amen. So, so well run, and the people are, are just so nice, and, uh, and, and it's just wonderful to be here. So, thank you for coming. Well, we, uh, we do things a little bit differently here because we don't have the convention on Sunday. We have a chance to, to check out the city while you're here? Sadly, no. <laughs> I kind of back ended it, unfortunately. And the more I'm around here, the more it's like, ugh. Really? I'll have to come back. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So I had a question for both of you to answer since you were part of a series that had a lot of stunts and a lot of people that you worked with probably to execute a lot of that. I was wondering if you had any thoughts about why there isn't a category for stunt people in the Academy Awards. It's kind of odd to me that it's never been added to it because it takes a lot of talent and a lot of skill to do. I wanted to be a stunt woman after watching The Fall Guy for a number of years. So I just wanted to know if you had any thoughts about that. I couldn't agree with you more. And my kids are stunt men, both boys, and my daughter-in-law and their dad. Yeah, and we, we just, it's really frustrating. Especially today with all of the amount of action stuff there is today, all this wild stuff, wire work, all this, it's, it's insane that they don't, it really is. They have their own. They don't, does anybody ever get to see the Taurus Awards? They must be accessible somehow. With, do you know if they're streamed at all, the Taurus Awards? Anyway, look them up. They do have their own, they do have their own, you know, thing for stunt people, but. Oh, you don't, I think I did the Taurus Awards. What? I think I got an award, the Taurus Awards. I did, I got something lab, but let me tell you a quick story. As old as we are, and as long as I've been, we've been working, I've been working 56 years now going into this business, and uh, I, last year they gave me a, uh, I got a, a Life Achievement uh, Award, and uh, I had to tell a story that like uh, two weeks before then, I went in on a, ca a casting call kind of thing, to, to, and I met with a casting agent, uh, a young lady, and I was sitting down at the desk, and uh, across from this young lady, and she said, uh, what have you done? And I, I kind of took a deep breath and uh, said, um, you first. So my question is for both of you. When you signed up to do the Bionic shows, did Kenneth Johnson or anybody give you any idea how much running would be involved during this time? Involved in what? In the show. How much it costs to make the show? No, no, how much How much running you would have to do physically. Money. I thought you said money. You know? Oh, sorry, I'm close to the money. money too. Yeah. Right. Where in the hell did that come from? <laughs> yeah. 
Well, uh, Ken Kenneth Johnson didn't have anything to do with the original uh, Six Million Dollar Man. I think he came in at a later date and produced and created her show. So, uh, no. Uh, I, I, I found out after the first movie how much running it was because I, we filmed a scene down in uh, uh, in Arizona, y Yuma, Arizona, where they have these, uh, it looks like the desert. I mean, I'm talking about sand dunes as high as this building, or I mean, higher than this building, because it's not very high. But uh, running up and down those sand dunes one day, all day, I said, I, I think I bit off a little bit more than I could chew. And ever since then, it's been running, 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 and fight, fight, and, and wrestling Bigfoot. And so, but. Um, they kind of wore my knees out, so I, I did just have both knees replaced about seven months ago. So I'm back bionic now again. So it's okay. it, but it was all slow running, though. It was. I'm running in slow motion now. now? <laughs> yeah, and well, you know, I had the obvious uh, advantage because the show was already established. The fact that that was there, although I hadn't seen it, but then I saw it in the script and watched a couple episodes and realized. But I, I didn't think, I didn't think about it. It was just like, okay, I'm gonna have to run. Mm -hmm. But I didn't think I was gonna have to run in June in California, it, out in the, you know the desert and the air and literally. And I'm that's probably a little TMI, but. You know, I don't sweat well. <laughs> it's got its good sides, right? But it also has its bad sides because that's how your body cools itself. And so a couple times I was just running and just boop, just passed right out. And uh, it was too because I worked, my body wasn't uh, handling it so well. So we tried to do as much with the stunt girls possible on the, on the long shots. And then, but no, there was there was a fair amount of running. Hi, thank you. For here. It's awesome to meet you too, and I just want to ask, um, have you ever thought about, um, because you were a big part of my life for being, staying strong in school and just facing anything hard because of your shows were very inspiring. Have you ever thought about making a remake of you guys be like, and I'm not saying about your age because you guys both look awesome, but do like bionic grandma and six million dollar grandma? <laughs> Well, the thing is, it isn't up to us. You know, the studio owns the franchise. We don't. We'd be doing all kinds of crazy things, I suppose, if, if we could. But. Well, they are doing a reboot of the movie. It's going to be the six billion dollar man. <laughs> Somehow we got shortchanged on that deal. <laughs> the Mark, Mark Wahlberg will be starring in it. Peter Berg will be producing. And uh, the, uh, it's, it's, they're going to start it next year. Uh, they're writing the script and it'll be... Uh, done sometime next year. Uh, on that, on online, under on, on that page, they don't have the whole cast listed. They do have Mark Wahlberg as Lee, as, as Lee Majors, as Steve Austin. I've been looking for my name too. <laughs> but I, I really want to see Jamie Summers in that movie somewhere. I think that'd be great. Don't you think? Sequel, spin off. Hello. Uh, I'd like to know when uh, Big Valley Eve's one uh, six million dollar man and bionic woman will be on Blu-ray. As if we owned it. <laughs> we don't have anything to do with reruns. In fact, you're talking Big Valley. Uh, I don't. It's run every day somewhere. It's still today, and back in that, those days, we didn't have residuals, so you don't get a penny from those. So, uh, as far as Blu-ray, uh, I don't know. That maybe Lindsay does. Oh, sorry, can't help you with that. There is some information out there about it. There is some uh, season one to two released on DVD, etc. I'm wondering if, in the run-up to the six billion dollar man, they might re-release that stuff to, to get the interest going again? I, I don't know. It'd be quite a remaster, though, <laughs> to Blu-ray. That'd be interesting to see. With a number of episodes. Are there other series that are on Blu-ray? Or just movies? I only know. Oh, yeah, all, all kinds a of stuff. A lot of series on Blu-ray? Yeah. Well, I suppose it's not that big of a deal these days, too. No, I'm just wondering how it would look <laughs> being transferred. But I guess we'll see. You kids are spoiled. Blu-ray. Yeah. 
you know the old story. Like when I was young, I had to I had to walk through six feet of shag carpet to change the channel. <laughs> Go change the channel, son. Okay, Dad. It's tough work. <laughs> what is it they say? The truest form of laziness is when you're too lazy to tell your kid to get up and go change the channel for you. <laughs> okay, question for you. Lee, you were my... <clears throat> one of my first crushes, thank you. But Lindsay, you were my first inspiration. And I really enjoyed both of your characters and enjoyed the crossovers that you had in the, um, in the series. Lindsay, the question for you is, I remember one of your first episodes, you had torn a phone book in half. Can you tell us how that was done? I'd have to kill you, though. <laughs> All right. They score it. They score it. You know. But it still was. It was still it took a lot of effort. <laughs> yeah. If you look close, that was the man's hand. <laughs> wow. It's a good thing they don't have these microphones backstage. <laughs> hey, um, thank you guys for being here. When I was a little girl, I grew up in Oregon. And I saw you at a grocery store, and my mother grabbed me and she said, do not, you will not talk to her. And my question is, now that I'm an adult and I can ask, how did you feel about fans coming up and talking to you? Oh boy, that, that's a journey, honestly. A lot of people think oh, it would be, you know, it would be fun to be famous and all of that. Once you lose your anonymity, you really find a whole other part of yourself that you've never had to deal with before. Because in the case of something as popular as Lee's show, my show, you know, that kind of thing, it is relentless. And for a while it took me, it took me a while to figure out how to deal with that inside me. Because I was a really kind of shy and quiet, you know, to myself person, very private person. I was not out the most with it kind of thing. And not a party person or, you know, like to me, having eight people over for dinner is like a big party. <laughs> so. It was tough. Um, I would shop, do my grocery shopping at 11 o'clock at night, you know, or whatnot. Um, but eventually, I realized this isn't going to change. And per my comment earlier, I had to find a place within myself so that I didn't always feel put upon. Because people don't think about it. You know, you go up to somebody and you think, you know, oh, it's just, it's just me. Yeah, we did this, 10 other people just thought it was me today, too, you know? And I'm, it's not a complaint, and believe me, it's not a complaint. It's just that in here, psychologically, you really have to make an adjustment to, to let that work in your life. And so I had to, for me, what I had to learn was that sometimes I had to say no, but I didn't think I could do that, and I didn't want to hurt anybody's feelings. So I was always giving up what was important to me every time that happened, like if I was involved with my kids or my husband or whatever, or something special was going on and I really didn't want the interruption, I didn't feel like I could say no. And so I learned that it's okay. I can be nice to me too. And sometimes I just need to say, not right now with my family. And you know what? People were always fine with it. But I was so afraid they'd be upset or hurt or whatever. So once I dealt with that and kind of dealt with my fear of confrontation, because I was afraid a confrontation might happen, I mean, it's only been once or twice where it was ever weird. And other than that, people are like, oh, sorry, of course, okay, come on, you know, whatever. And I stopped being afraid of it. And so I found myself doing it more and being happy to do it than I ever had in the past, because I wasn't walking around with that perspective, that stencil in front of me. So that was kind of my personal journey with it. I don't know what it was like for me, but, you know, I think we all have to go through that. It's like losing a leg, <laughs> you know, I'm seriously. I mean, it's, there's a part of you that's just gone. It'll never be back in your life. Well, um, try walking into a bar and some drunk saying, you want to arm wrestle? <laughs> Thinking that you're really the $6 million man, I don't know. 
but they're, they're, they're very hard things you have to uh, greet and meet in life. A lot of, a lot of, most of the people are very nice, and it's, it's, uh, but there are times when it's, it's inconvenient, but you go with it, flow. It's part of the, it's part of uh, what we do. So thank you. So I know that overall your time as the bionic duo is a very small percentage of your life, but in our world, you two are forever a couple. Um, and being a couple, can you tell us something you either really love, or maybe like a true couple, I wish he would never fill in the blank. To be truthful, these days I love his wife. <laughs> he has the coolest wife in the world. <laughs> Faith, wherever you are, this is a shout out to you. We kind of, we didn't see each other for a lot of years, um, you know, when our careers went different ways. And when the, I think it was when the Italian, went, or when they re did the European release of the DVDs was when we really kind of spent any time together again for the first time. And that's when I met Faith. And, you know, so we've, uh, for we me, it's been so much fun. We did a movie recently. Hmm? We did the Hallmark recently. No, no, yeah. But I mean, the first time we reconnected and when I met Faith, and we actually got to know each other because we were working so much, so hard, and it was so grueling, you know, People were grumpy and blah, 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 blah. We just, like you said earlier, you know, getting the job done and going home. So when we started doing PR together years later with all the DVDs coming out and some autograph shows, for me, that was just such a blessing because we got to know each other as people and it was just, it's been beautiful. So that's my favorite thing, you know. Thanks, Ed. Well, uh, the Bionic Man and the things that followed uh, all, of, all of the other uh, shows uh, were, were very novel and very exciting for the time, but I, I have to say that growing up then, uh, part of the appeal was uh, seeing this face that we'd seen for so many hours on the, the, the big valley that we were uh, familiar with. Uh, what do you think of these uh, older shows? Is it stuff that should be buried and forgotten with the heyday of the studios producing all these westerns? or or did you have fond memories? Uh, what, do you, what do you think of these? Uh, well, that was, I have a lot of fond memories of the Big Valley because that was my first uh, series. And working with Barbara Stanwyck, who was really like a mentor to me, uh, I learned one thing from her in the business, and that was to be on time, know your lines, hit your mark, and keep your mouth shut, and you'll go a long way. So we're into 56 years here. and uh, but. Uh, the, 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 the Big Valley kind of went with all, the way of all of the Westerns, you know, when they got into the high-tech stuff. Westerns are kind of a lost art now. You see a, a great movie every now and then, but that's about it. But, yeah. Hello, I'm pleased to meet you. Um, my question is for Lindsay. You were on Warehouse 13, and that shows very funny and a lot of fun and working with Renee Aubergeois and Saul Rubinek and some of those other actors, do you have any fun antidotes that you would share about your work with them? Well, first of all, it was hard to keep a straight face. Talk about being professional. They were so wild and goofy and the nature of the show was just so fun. It was grueling, but um, but I think what I remember the most is, is that, and they were, they were just so good to work with as, as professionals. And because this, the series was so whimsical, we could kind of sometimes add lib and embellish on things, make things a little better. And so that, those were the, the fun things that I actually remember. There wasn't any real specific anecdote that I can think of that you know, pops out. It was more the nature of what it was like working there and, and having fun. Other than it was freezing cold in Canada. Yeah. Yeah. Outside scenes were just awful. <laughs> Not a very fun anecdote, but <laughs> the truth. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I was very sorry to see that show go. Yeah. Uh, did anyone else own a Steve Austin action figure? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I 
told my friends, oh, I'm doing the bionic panel. Every one of them went, I own Steve Austin and, and uh, have an orange jumpsuit, I think. And you can interchange it with a white one. And I just need to do this. I just need to do this because uh, I don't think I could. I just need to look through the back of your head for a second. And you saw a really lousy fishbowl version of whatever you were looking at. But it was awesome, and everyone had one. You know, uh, Lindsay and I are probably very amazed at all the, uh, we'll call it memorabilia or collectibles that they that, that fans bring to our table to sign and everything. But you know, we, we see stuff that we've never seen before. We never got a penny from any of that when they sold all that stuff. So don't think that it's anything from, of us, you know. Universal took everything, so, but uh, uh, like, there's my red jumpsuit there. That you, have. <laughs> you have a question, sir? Yes, yes. You know where orange jumpsuits are now, right? <laughs> would, would both of you please briefly comment about the activities and entertainments you did while you were young and what attracted you to the acting profession? I don't know what the first part of Well, I, I'll start. I, 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 I grew up uh, playing all sports and wanted to be a football coach and, uh, and played college football. And then I got an injury. Uh, and uh, and uh, a couple of my teammates uh, dared me to go out uh, and try out for this play. Uh, and it was a college play. And so uh, I went and I did uh, an audition. And then I found out that I got the part. And then it scared me because I had to do it. It was called The Crucible, and I had the lead, lead part of John John. A little Proctor. light drama. <laughs> yeah, a little light drama, and I'm down in the center stage on, on one knee, and, and they came to take my wife away. Uh, to, I don't know if they burned her at the cross or, or, or at the stake or put her, put her anyway. Uh, and on the front row, you're not supposed to look out past that line, you know, the imaginary line into the audience. And, but I did happen to notice that the, all my teammates that were sitting in the front row were big, big guards and tackles, and they had their girlfriends. And I looked and saw the girlfriends had little tears coming down their eyes. And and then I looked, and the guys, their eyes were a, a little glassy, you know. And I, and I thought to myself at that moment, I said, "Now I can do this." <laughs> and that's it just kind of started me on my my journey. So my question was, what was your guys' favorite celebrity encounter you ever had? Somebody like Chuck Norris who was working at the same time as you guys. Somebody who just, you're starstruck, you're like, I can't believe you know who I am and what I'm doing. Actually, it wasn't anybody I worked with. <laughs> it was Anne Bancroft. And I met her because the Robert Wise, I did my first feature film with Robert Wise. And he was then, after our film, doing the Hindenburg at Universal, and I was still under contract at the time, so anyway, I went to have lunch with him, and he said he had to go over to the set, and he's Anne Bancroft, and I went, oh my God, she's like one of my favorite actresses, so he said, well, come over and meet her, and I was still pretty young, I was, it was 1970, 71, so it must have been late, 72, or maybe 73, and, um, Robert introduced us, and I'd only ever I'd done like, what, maybe 12 or 13 guest starring episodes at Universal, and then this first feature film with Robert, which wasn't even out yet. And she, after when they introduced us, she said, oh, I saw you on Marcus Welby when you had Myasthenia Gravis. And I went, <laughs> oh my God. You, uh, uh, and I was completely, my mouth was all dry, I didn't know what to say. I was just blown away, and talk about a compliment in your heart like that, you know. That I think was my most uh, starstruck moment. I, that was great. That just blew my, blew my mind. That's way cool. What yeah. about for you, Lee? I have no comment on that, actually. Because <laughs> he knows he has to say me, he has to say me. time. <laughs> Oh, actually, we're out of time, and I can sing. So, uh, 
Um, yeah, we're, we're, we're getting we, there, we're uh, wrapping up. Uh, just, to, just to circle back, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, we, uh, Lindsay and I, are, our tables are right together, so I went, now our, uh, our, uh, for your all's assignment is to go directly to the tables, and we'll meet you there. <laughs> all of them. And then we have a photo up at 2 o'clock, so we'll see you soon, okay? I'll tell you what, I have Thank a last question for, for you that you might have to get involved with. If for the $6 billion man movie, if someone was to say create some kind of a audience driven petition to have you guys in that movie, how would you respond to that? It works. I can say it, it works. <laughs> Go for it. You have your mission. With these guys in that movie. Right after you come to the table. <laughs> It's, uh, yeah, Mark Wahlberg is uh, Steve Austin. They have Travis Knight now as the director. They've had some directors change. He just directed Bumblebee, which did really well. And uh, Harv Bennett is writing it. And if any of you know him, he actually worked on the original one. And he basically created Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, after Star Trek I was iffy. So he knows how to take something that uh, you know, a lot of people love and bring the, the really cool elements of it into the future. So, looking forward to seeing you on the big screen again. Thank you. <laughs> Bless you. Bless you. Thank you.